on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. What are we supposed to eat? What was the human animal's optimal diet? Why is there such confusion and disagreement about that? When you look at hunting and gathering people, they're eating something in the vicinity of 200 species a year versus us today in the United States, we're eating about 30 species a year. You don't just run up to a deer and grab it. You learn the ecology of deer through the process of hunting it. If you could learn one plant a year that you can actually work with and how to work with it and how to harvest it, what you can do with it, you're going to feel so much much more connected to the planet than you feel today. To make love is intimate, but to eat something is to make your body from the thing. The most intimate act. You are now part of me forever. We're not talking about eating nuts and twigs and berries. We're talking about eating the food that the best chefs in the world are fighting to get their hands on. I'm working in my kitchen with the best ingredients you can imagine. Episode number 77 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Original Human Diet, with Daniel Vitalis and Dr. Matt Dawson, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Reishi and Chaga are amongst the most potent and well-researched of the medicinal mushrooms, and there's dozens of studies showing their ability to regulate immune health, fight cancers, and function as powerful adaptogens. But these aren't mushrooms you simply eat. They need to be extracted, and no one does it better than Sir Thrival. Most extracts of reishi and chaga are just simple tinctures or capsules filled with less effective, artificially grown mushroom mycelia. But in order to get the full benefits, you need to start with the highest grade of mushrooms and make a dual extraction. That's because two separate extracts are required, one in alcohol to get the adaptogenic terpenes and another in hot water to extract the immune-modulating beta-glucans. Sir Thrival does it right, starting with organic wood-grown reishi and wild-crafted chaga, making both extractions and then recombining them for the most potent medicinal mushroom supplements you'll find anywhere. Right now, buy a bottle of Sir Thrival's reishi or chaga dual extract and get a second bottle for half off. No coupons required and the discount is applied at checkout. Find them and more at SirThrival.com. Have you tried real hand-harvested wood-parched wild rice? If you answered no, you need to head over to wildfoodwarehouse.com and get yourself some. Wildfoodwarehouse.com delivers premium, wild-crafted wild rice from the Great Lakes region direct to your door with bulk pricing beginning at 5 pounds and 10% off your order when you use the coupon code WILDFED. Wild rice is the original staple grain of North America, and it cooks up soft and delicious with robust, nutritious, nutty flavors that make white and brown rice taste as bland as Wonder Bread. If you asked me to name my five favorite wild foods, wild rice would definitely make the list. In fact, I made an episode of the Wild Fed TV show about it because to me, it's a sacred food. Go over to wildfoodwarehouse.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for 10% off your order. Again, it's wildfoodwarehouse.com and the coupon code is WILDFED. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. For today's show, we're doing things a little different. If you tuned in last week, you heard my interview with Dr. Matt Dawson of Wild Health, and he's got his own podcast by the same name, which he interviewed me for the week we recorded his episode for Wild Fed. And I thought since I spend so much time talking to other guests on this podcast that I'd turn things around and release the episode where he interviewed me. One of the reasons is that this interview sums up a lot of my own personal journey as well as the underlying philosophy that led me to make this podcast, the Wild Fed TV show, and to dedicate so much of my time and energy to the pursuit of wild foods. I think this interview speaks for itself, but remember that you can learn more about Dr. Matt Dawson and his genomics-based, personalized precision medicine practice at wildhealth.com or on his show, The Wild Health Podcast. And I recommend heading over to wildhealthsummit.com to learn more about the event that Matt is hosting in Kentucky at the end of this May, 2021. I'll be speaking there along with some other incredible guests like Sam Thayer, the author of The Forager's Harvest, and probably the leading author and teacher on foraging in North America. For now, though, enjoy this interview, which will give you a glimpse into what brought me here and why I do what I do. And big thanks to Dr. Matt Dawson for sharing this interview with our community. Matt, I'll see you at the end of May in Kentucky. Daniel, thank you for joining us so much on the the Wild Health Podcast. Um, I 
I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, for those of you who are listening in and you don't know Daniel Vitalis, most of you probably do. Um, but as it's kind of an introduction, uh, Daniel's done a lot. Uh, he's done a lot of really cool stuff, but I think the best way for me to, to talk about Daniel and what he does is, uh, as you all know, listening to this, my job is uh, healthcare and wellness. And most of the podcasts I listen to, I listen to a lot, are health and wellness podcasts. And they're mostly educational. But I allow myself kind of one <laughs> for fun podcast, which may make me kind of boring and, uh, and, <laughs> and one-sided. But the one podcast I listen to for fun, my favorite podcast is the Wild Fed podcast. And that's Daniel's podcast. It's, it's a really incredible podcast. I listen to it and I get to kind of escape for a little while and, and uh, imagine that I'm Daniel doing all these cool things in the woods <laughs> and in the wild, but I'm not. So the next best thing is, is to have him here on the show with us. So thanks so much for, for joining us on the Wild Health Podcast, Daniel. Matt, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me share my voice with your audience and to everybody listening. You know, thanks so much for taking the time to, you know, check out what I have to say today. Yeah, and I'd like to, I guess, just start by talking about your journey. Um, you, you've had an interesting journey. You've kind of been in the health and wellness space for a while, but um, you, like everybody, has evolved, um, and you've kind of changed your mind on, on some things. Can you just tell me about kind of your journey in health and wellness and how you've landed with the Wild Fed podcast? Sure. I got started in health and wellness as a as you know, actively like a participant when I was a teenager, I got pretty lucky to get started on taking care of my body as a young person. Um, so I was about 16 years old. I got really into nutrition and uh, had a mentor who got me into things like juicing and raw foods and things like that. And uh, so I got started going as a teenager. By the time I was 20, I was a vegan and I, and I did a very long-term veganism experiment on myself. Um, but when I tell people that, I, f I feel like I have to add a little to it, which is that I, I was doing raw foods. I did many years of fruitarianism. So this was an extremely strict protocol. I mean, there were years where I didn't eat salt or oils or, you know, very, very strict whole food diet. And then, uh, then when the superfood movement emerged, I was a big part of that. I got to be sort of there at the ground level and speaking at a lot of events by then. Um, got to know a lot of the big vegan and raw food speakers and, and authors and worked alongside them, shared stages with them, went to a lot of those kind of conferences to speak. Um, but eventually uh, came across the, you know, really to say backing up, I had always been really interested in the idea of what was the human animal's optimal diet. I've, I've always been, I've always found it very strange that if we picked up any encyclopedia or went to any zoologist and we said, hey, what's the what's an ostrich eat? They're going to be like, oh, here's the diet and the foods included in that diet. And we could do that. We could go through a catalog of any animal we want and find out what its, what its ideal diet is. And if we we're going to raise that animal in captivity, we'd look at that and we'd try to recreate that diet. So I was always like, why has this not happened with people? What are we supposed to eat? Why is there such confusion and disagreement about that? So that was always my interest. And uh, after about 10 years of being a vegan, um, which I want to say is a little bit longer than most people hold out. Uh, I'm not saying that to brag, it's quite the opposite. Uh, my tenaciousness was foolhardy. I wish I'd stopped sooner because I think there's a certain point where you start to really starve yourself. And I think, you know, I was at that point. Um, I'll do this experiment sometimes when I'm, I'm giving public talks and I'll say, I'll say, everybody in the audience, raise your hand if you know a vegan, you know? all the hands go up and I go, okay, now you can only leave your hand up if you know somebody who's been a vegan longer than five years. And you just watch all these hands just drop and then I'll go 10 years and then there's like five hands up and then I'll go 20 years and then there might be one hand up and you can just keep pushing that 21, 22, 20, eventually it comes down and I'll go, nobody here knows anybody who's been a vegan for even close to their whole life. And then the vegans say we should all switch to this experimental diet and we should bear children under this approach with no studies, no research, and no, you know, long-term demographics on this makes no sense. And so I started to realize that, that I was, what I thought was a very natural, healthy diet for people was actually more of a fad diet. And I came across the work of Dr. Weston Price. I'm sure you're familiar with his uh, really incredible book, um, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn about hunter-gatherer diets. You know, I had, I just wasn't raised around anthropology. I just didn't understand that a lot of this had already been looked at and we knew what humans did and ate. 
So I got into that. And for years, I got to speak around the country and world uh, talking about natural human diets and, you know, sort of the evolution of our diet. And then how do we practically apply, you know, anthropology to nutrition? Um, Eventually, after many years in that world, uh, started a successful company, did really well with that, you know, a nutrition company. It's still going after 13 years um, called Sir Thrival. And, uh, but eventually just said, you know what, I want to take this to the next level. What would it look like to become a modern day hunter gatherer? And so rather than trying to do the, like, I go to whole foods and forage, I was like, what if I just really started to build a diet around what I can hunt fish and forage? Uh, so speeding up to today, now I'm 42 and, um, I've been, uh, you know, making a television show and doing a podcast about this very thing. I, I hunt and fish all the protein in our house. I'm sugar self-sufficient from my uh, maple trees here. I'm cooking maple sap today, actually down in maple syrup. Uh, I do quite a bit of foraging. Now I'm not a hundred percent hunter gatherer. I don't know anybody who is anymore, but, but I've been living this um, lifestyle of taking everything I learned in the health world and then and saying what, you know, how do I practically apply it to lifestyle today in something that connects me back to the natural world and gets me out of the very heated, um, diet wars that are always taking place. So making that kind of transition, you said about 10 years of uh, veganism, how did you make the transition? Was it that you, were you doing testing of your blood work? Were you just going on how you felt? What was the trigger to make the transition? Why did you change your mind? Yeah, I've always been, I think almost in really stark contrast to what you guys do. It's like almost right on the other end of the spectrum. I've been a person who's, who's been pretty wild and pretty averse to a lot of clinical stuff. So um, I was going largely on feel and intuition, but I'll say that the kind of things that would start happening after years, well, one is that when you're surrounded by people who are constantly telling you, um, there's like this game I've noticed in the world of nutrition, it's like a constant reshuffling of macronutrients. So if you look at just about any diet, what it is is almost always going to be some ratio of macronutrients you're supposedly supposed to have. So it's going to either be a high protein diet or a high fat diet or a high carbohydrate diet. Uh, we've not yet had the alcohol diet, which I'm kind of waiting for to make its big splash. But um, I was, you know, at that point, what happens when you've got people telling you, hey, be careful, don't eat too much fat. And then in the vegan world, you get this constant thing of not too much protein causes cancer. And then all of a sudden we started to get all the anti-sugar diets, right? So it was like, stay off your carbohydrates. It was getting really confusing to me. It's like, what am I supposed to be eating? And in the raw food vegan world, you have some pretty far out stuff like the idea of like constant fasting, breatharianism, sunitarianism, all these crazy things. But what I started to notice was that I was always hungry. Nothing satisfied my hunger. Um, and I would have lots of little immune system issues, um, like cold sores or sores in my nose and in and around my gums and just left all these kind of things. I mean, in the beginning of a diet like that, you feel incredible, you know, it's like fasting. I mean, you just, you feel incredible, but years go on and it starts to be a slog. So, um, the transition for me looked like, I think it looks for a lot of people. I started with dairy products. I started with, um, grass fed dairy, but it was scary how bad my body wanted these things. I mean, I remember in the beginning, I was eating two pounds of butter a day. Is that crazy or what? I'd go to this, um, I got a friend locally here who has a herd of Jersey cows in the mountains, all on grass. And I would buy these blocks of the most beautiful, I still buy them, the most beautiful butter you've ever seen. Uh, I'd sit there and just eat it like a candy bar. And I'd get done a pound, a couple hours later, I'd eat another pound. That went on for weeks. You know, I started to get onto eventually onto fish, onto white meat. I think it's also funny how there's this like hierarchy of meat healthiness based on color that we do, where it's like, well, white meats are better for you than the red meats. It's like, whatever that means. But I did that, you know, so I ate chicken and turkey and stuff like that. Eventually I started eating things like bison and, and that I started to get some vigor back, you know, and I could finally start to put some mass on again too. Cause the other thing is um, I had been into bodybuilding when I was a teenager and had accumulated a lot of lean body, body muscle mass. And then, you know, you lose that on a diet like this over time. You know, I know people, people go like, no, look at so-and-so raw vegan bodybuilder guy on the internet. And it's like, okay, you, you got three examples and where do they go? Where are they in 10 years? You know what I mean? So I, I lost a lot of weight and I gained, I started gaining that back. Um, and, uh, and eventually just, you know, there was no, a lot of people think like, oh, if 
if you've been a vegan a while and you ate some meat, like you're going to get sick or you're going to get nauseous or it's going to be hard to digest. I didn't experience anything like that. In fact, I started to realize that meat was one of the things that was the easiest for me to digest, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, over the course of it, there was a lot less body adjustment than there was, um, mental intellectual adjustment. Yeah. I was wrestling with a lot. One of the things that people often don't realize when they're having these conversations about what's an optimal diet is the degree to which people are identified with these things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like if, uh, you know, you, it's like trying to tell a mother that she's not a mother. It's like, that's her identity. You start to tell a vegan like they're wrong. It's like, that's their whole world's wrapped up in that. They will, they would rather go to fisticuffs than to how do you let go of your identity? So for me, there was a long period of transitioning mentally a lot more than there was physically. The food part was easy. Actually, I was so hungry after, after all those years. How, how do you feel? Uh, some people now uh, to take the opposite of, of extreme uh, are doing a carnivore diet. Uh, I love it. I love it. It's yeah. so funny to me. <laughs> Um, I, I always joke around. I go, I go like, at some point, people are going to come around to the obvious, the omnivory diet. Yeah. I mean, seriously, watching, I've been in nutrition now, like I said, since I was 16, I'm in my 40s. What you notice is the pendulum swings back and forth, back and forth from one extreme to the other extreme with only minor pauses in the middle ever. It's hilarious. So yeah, if you're going to have veganism become a worldwide movement, guarantee it will be countered by an all meat diet. And what's so funny is that people are saying the same thing about the all meat diet that they were saying about the all plant diet. And again, if we just take the zoological approach and we say, Hey, let's do a quick survey of every natural traditional group of people that were ever encountered before they got access to Western foods and industrial food systems and what did they eat? And what we find is that there have never been vegans. And to my knowledge, there have never been all carnivore diets either. People get real confused about this and they start making stuff up because their, their grasp of, you know, the Pleistocene era is not very good. So they'll be this like, no, we were eating mastodons. It's like, yeah, okay. In the ice age on the glaciers, what were the mastodons eating? Because they're plant eaters, which means there was plants around. And people always take advantage of plants. But the thing is, is when you look in the fossil record or you look in the archaeology, plant fibers just don't last. What lasts are stone artifacts. And stone artifacts are often associated with hunting. So what happened for a long time is people are finding arrowheads and spear points. And they're going, look, hunters, hunters, hunters. What are they not finding? Nets, cordage hand drills made of wood that they were using to make fire like that stuff breaks down it doesn't survive so it you know to the untrained eye it's like hey look at this all these hunting implements these people just ate meat it's like look we started off as apes we start off as plant eaters we transition into meat eating somewhere in the last three and a half million years and we have been meat eaters since there has never been a population of pure plant eaters ever. The closest thing we have would be in India where there's large scale vegetarianism reliant, very reliant on dairy products. And that's only possible because of large scale agriculture, which didn't exist 14,000 years ago. So that can't be how we started. But also when we look at peoples of the Arctic, where you'd say, well, maybe what about the, the so-called Eskimo, the Inuit, the Inupiat? What about them? Maybe they're just eating animal foods. Turns out they eat more plants than most of us eat in a year. It's from, from a species perspective, because they don't just have a long, harsh Arctic winter. They also have a 24 hours of sunlight growing season in the summer where they're eating crowberries and bilberries and blueberries and all kinds of lichens. And all, they're eating all kinds of plants, fungi and algae. And that forms a very important part of their diets. And so the idea that there's ever been carnivore people or there's ever been vegans. And I only say that because people like to argue that's the natural diet for people. Right. And it's, obs it's obscene. The natural diet for people is a hunter and gatherer approach, which is, I, I call it conscientious omnivory. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's great. We've, um, I love how you think about this. Uh, I agree with so much of what, what you're saying. And so we've kind of talked about what the wild fed diet is not. So tell me, tell me what you do eat. What does it look like? How do you kind of yeah. structure your day and year and how do you think about food? 
Okay, let me give a little bit of backup on that, and then I'll and I'll share about that because um, this is something I get excited that anyone would even ask me. <laughs> Yay! Um, one of the neat things about humans anthropologically is how many environments we're able to live in, right? So one reason you can't just go to Wikipedia and look at the human diet the way you can on other animals is because we're cosmopolitan. We've spread around the globe, right? So. That term cosmopolitan for people who aren't into the biology side of things and zoology, it just means we are, we're spread all around the globe. So we have people living in the Arctic and we have people living in the equator and we have people living almost down to the Antarctic naturally. We got seafarers who found their way to Hawaii. I mean, wow, you know, amazing. Humans are amazing. And um, we did a lot of that as hunter gatherers. And that means that where you live determines what you eat when you hunt and gather, right? So for me, I live in the Northeast in the state of Maine. So I, I have extended my foraging grounds through, you know, the power of my FJ cruiser and my, you know, airline tickets. It allows me to go, you know, a little bit further, but most of what I do is here. Um, I'll talk about some specific foods that I really love in a minute, but I want to first say that I think where people get confused about food is they actually don't know what food is. And this is this thing I'm always coming back to. This This is like the most basic teaching that I can offer is like, what's food? And you start asking people and you get very bizarre answers. And I always try to like dig in like, hey, keep going, keep going, follow it to the root. The answer, food is living body parts. It's the body parts of other species. Imagine how freed up humanity would be if we could just manufacture food from rocks, from minerals, from salts, from gases, from stardust or pixie dust or any number of other things. If we, could, if we could 3D print food out of things that aren't food, well, that would be great. We would no longer need you know, large scale farming. We could, we could slough Monsanto and their products right off of the map. We, could, you know, we wouldn't be worried about Bill Gates buying all the farmland in the United States. Like None of that would matter anymore, but we can't. The thing is, is that food is the body parts of living organisms. Now, this gets a little philosophical, but it's like if food is made out of the body parts, and let's test that theory real quick, just in case anybody's going like, wait a second, is that true? So there's a couple things we eat that might seem like exceptions, like we eat salt, but that's not a food. It doesn't have calories. That's a mineral, of course, right? Um, So we have some minerals in our diet, but those aren't caloric. We can live without them. And we can't, in other words, we can get enough sodium from our food. We don't need to eat it um, per se, even though we love it, but it doesn't provide sustenance. And there's some weird things like you could go, well, like, what about milk? Milk's not an animal. It's like, no, but milk's a liquid tissue from an animal. Or you could go like, well, what about honey? And it's like, okay, well, honey is pollen that's been eaten by bees and digested and puked out. And that's, it came from, it's flowers, right? So it is, it's all from living things. So if the food that we eat typically is going to be a steak or a piece of fish or a piece of chicken or a carrot or a piece of kale, those are body parts from organisms. So if we eat organisms, it means we're actually eating these like, individuals. We eat individuals or parts of individuals. And if we eat individuals, we're talking about living creatures that have, they come from a species. This is like so mind-blowing to me. We eat species most of us have never met in person. That's just, wow. When has that happened historically? Talk about unprecedented, right? Like it makes sense like a hundred years ago, you know, you lived on a farm and and it, did almost, it almost didn't matter who you were, whether you were really wealthy and aristocratic or you were in the peasantry, wherever you, or you were still hunting and gathering, you were in an uncontacted tribe or a barely contacted tribe or whatever, whatever your story was a hundred years ago, you would have known when you ate pork, what pork was, you know, it's, you would know, Hey, pigs, see them all the time, seen them slaughtered before, probably been part of it, been part of the butchering. Like I said, if you were aristocratic and hands off, you still knew what was going on at the ar- arbitoire or whatever. So you understood this, but today people eat things. They've never actually seen the creature before, you know, the number of fish, like when I started to actually get serious about fishing and it'd be like, Oh, that's what a haddock is. That's what a cod is. That's what a monkfish looks like. 
you know, wow, hey, a lobster's not red when it comes out of the sea. Didn't know that, right? Like that's what it looks like. It's very interesting to say, hey, what's a lettuce plant look like when it's not when it's lettuce leaves, but when it's fully grown? What does that look like? Do, do the listeners right now, be honest with yourself. Have you seen a fully grown lettuce plant? Would you recognize it? Because I walk down the road with people all the time past wild lettuces that people just have no idea what it is. And it's like, dude, that's where lettuce comes from. It's crazy to me. So the, the big thing here for me is when I think about what I eat, I don't think about it anymore. I feel so free now that I'm not hemmed in by what calories, what macro calories, what micronutrients, how many minerals, all that, you know, all this kind of counting and counting. Instead, I think about my diet based on who do I eat. Mm. And the reason I do that is because I think humans have become incredibly estranged from their relationships with the living things that they are um, integrally locked in step with. So it, my diet, it comes from things like, like I was saying today, I'm cooking maple syrup. Um, I live in part off the blood of maple trees. You know, that's yeah. pretty interesting that's to me. Or I live in part from the fruits of oak trees because I make flour out of acorns. Um, I live on a lot of deer and black bear and wild turkey. Um, I live off several species of fishes, uh, wild hog. I was eating wild hog bacon today that I made. Um, so there's all these different creatures that I eat. I eat species of fern and I eat, you know, different types of fruits and all kinds of roots and tubers and and, you know, obviously, like everybody listening, I still go to the farmer's market or the supermarket or whatever to get a lot of the stuff that bulks out our diet. But when I think about the human diet and what's changed, one of the big things that's changed is when you look at hunting and gathering people, they're eating something in the vicinity of 200 species a year versus us today in the United States, we're eating about 30 species a year. And where people, people don't realize it because those species, if, corn is a fantastic example. So corn, which was called maize, corn is a generic term for a grain uh, that, you know, Europeans came up with. So they would say a corn of wheat or a corn of barley. It's just a generic term for a grain. They, they gave the name, they gave maize the name corn, but it was called maize. We think it came from a grass called teosintle, which if you saw the wild plant, would never imagine it could ever become corn, Right. But today, through industrial applications of enzymatic processes and things like that, we're able to fracture corn and turn it into probably an unlimited number of food products. So you go into the supermarket and you could eat 150 things in there and not realize they're all corn. Mm -hmm. And so you tell somebody, hey, your diet is so limited. You're eating so few things. And it's like, no, I eat this, 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 and this. And it's like, oh, those were all corn. That's mm -hmm. one species. Right. So similarly, um, another example I really like for people who are on more whole food diets is I try to I'll take people into the supermarket, you know, in, in an imaginary supermarket. And I'll say, hey, look around your supermarket in your mind. Look around your produce section. Think about what the produce section where you shop looks like and start breaking down how many species are really there because there's some real tricky things going on through the power of horticulture. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. I had a great time interviewing Emma and Claire, aka the Salmon Sisters, for episode number 51 of this podcast called Made of Salmon. These ladies grew up homesteading in Alaska where they still live and work commercial fishing for salmon, halibut, and Pacific cod. If you love wild food and you want to sample or fill your freezer with wild caught Alaskan salmon, cod, or halibut, head over to aksalmonsisters.com where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 20% off your first order of wild fish. Check out their Wild Alaska Coho Salmon Box for vacuum sealed serving size portions or their Wild Alaskan Sockeye Salmon Box for full fillets that'll feed your family and fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready to eat smoked salmon in pouches and their smoked salmon tins, which are also ready to eat. Also check out their beautiful cookbook, their super cool women's clothing line and their own custom line of printed extra tough brand boots. Head over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store and use the coupon code WILDFED, which now gets you 20% off your first order of wild Alaskan fish. Now, back to the show. 
So my favorite example would be uh, the plant called Brassica oleracea. We all know this plant. Most of us have never met the wild plant from you know Scotland in the UK, but we know its domesticated counterparts in many different forms. So we know its leaves as kale, collard, all of the cabbages, purple ones and green ones. Um, we know it as kohlrabi. We know it as Brussels sprouts. We know its flowers as both broccoli and cauliflower. This is all just one species. Um, I could go on because there's several other things that come out of that plant. We think, oh, I'm eating a variety. Each day I eat a different plant. It's like, no, those are all one, only one plant. And that matters because plants have defenses. And when you overeat any one plant, you tend to get a lot of that plant's defenses. And some of those chemicals aren't really great for your body. For instance, with that plant, Brassica oleracea, it has a goitrogen in it. It robs your body of iodine if you overeat it. But people don't know and they think they're eating a different plant every night. And in some cases, they might be eating that one plant almost every single night for the whole year. So at the end of the year, you look at your diet and you go, man, it's pretty bankrupt from a species perspective. So my goal is how many species can I eat in a year? Yeah. And the, the interesting thing to me about that is you mentioned the kind of ancestral 300 species, we 30, and you would think it with eating a smaller number, there would be a more intimate connection, but it's totally opposite. It's a opposite. complete disconnection. You yeah. talk about milk you mentioned, and, and I saw a statistic one time about how many kids knew where milk came from. And it was shocking to me. Wow. Like they, they think it comes from the, the grocery store and, so and, I and we're surrounded by it too. You, you talked about walking by the wild lettuce. Um, I remember the first time I brought someone on to um, some land where I lived and I wanted them to, to teach me more about this because I didn't learn this growing up. And I thought, okay, we've got a hundred acres to work with here. I wonder what all we're going to find. They looked at me kind of strange and I realized why later an hour into it, we had moved about 10 yards because there was just so much, so much in every diversity. piece of ground, like so, so many edible species. Um, yeah. and I really like your, uh, your definition of food as, uh, um, parts of other living organisms, uh, plus B puke. I'm going to add that in. So <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're, that. sometimes they're vomit. Yeah. You know, when you think about this too, if you were in a, in a tribe of people, like it might sound so crazy to people listening, like imagine I'm a part of a tribe of hunter gatherers. It's like, well, that's where you come from, you know, just let's be real here. Like we all come from that. Um, and not that long ago, when you start to think in terms, I get, you know, part of my podcast, I interview a lot of archeologists and anthropologists. And when you do talk to people like that, or if, you know, let's say you're into astronomy, astrophysics, anything like where you start thinking in big history terms, you start realizing the agricultural revolution, which began about 10, a little more, maybe 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years is nothing in human history. When you look at like modern Homo sapiens might be 300,000 years old. So 10,000, just in our modern, I mean, like go back 300,000 years ago, grab a person, bring them here and, and they could become president of the United States. You know, like a regular fully formed humans. We're not talking, I'm not even talking about Neanderthals or Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis. I'm talking about modern Homo sapiens. We're, we've been around a while. We've only been farming for 10,000 years, but that's not like 10,000 years ago, people planted and then immediately a revolution went around the world and everyone adopted it. Quite the opposite. Actually, what really happened was everyone resisted it and fell one by one by one because the agricultural peoples could grow their population so big. Now, when they did that, the fossil record's really clear. They got a lot of new diseases. Their skeletons shrunk. They started to be afflicted with very serious arthritic conditions. Um, a lot of bad things came out of those bank, nutritionally more bankrupt diets. They had suddenly more calories, but less nutrients. And they were able to store those calories. And human beings are made out of one thing. We're made out of food. And so the more food you have in surplus, the more people you can grow. So eventually what happens is the, the city states that rely on agriculture so far, there's never been a city that grows its food inside the city. All the cities get their food from outside the city. So in order to continue to grow your city state, well, you need more and more and more and more and more arable land. Over time, what happened is the so-called Neolithic revolution was mostly and, and is still mostly resisted by peoples around the world. 
but agricultural peoples tend to force it onto people and people are assimilated. So the last holdouts fighting against agriculture are in a few places in the world. They're in Indonesia, they're in South America, you know, they're in uh, some islands off of India. You know, there's a few places where people are still hunting and gathering. So not a complete thing yet, not the whole world's on this, but we call it the Neolithic revolution. It's new. We are hunter gatherers. Okay. But point was, if we hunt and gather or when we hunted and gathered, you don't just, uh, you know, run up to a deer and grab it. You learn the ecology of deer through the process of hunting it. Similarly, uh, as I, you know, tap maple trees to make maple syrup, I get to know maple trees, right? Over time, I f- I'm very familial with them. Um, when I go out to harvest my fiddleheads, fern fiddleheads soon uh, in the coming weeks, you know, I, I have to go to that spot, assess that plant. Where is it in its growth cycle? It's only edible for two weeks for me. I get to know that plant. So what happens is over time, you start to know all of these different creatures. And it makes you realize the truly lonely plight of Homo sapiens today. Because we have become like a shut-in species. Like um, we've become so miserly and so um, reclusive in that we don't want to know any other species but us, dogs, cats, and the ginkgo trees in our city. And that's it. And I don't really want to know those ginkgo trees. Just want them to be there so my dog has a place to pee. It's like we don't want to know other species. How many people could even tell you anything about that houseplants in their homes? Like people just, we're focused on other people. And everything, when we think of culture, we just think of other people. Humans, more humans, more humans, more humans. Seven billion people. Oh, my God. And um, we don't know many other species. So it makes us, well, first, I think it engenders ideas like let's go to other planets, Rather than like, hey, let's learn about our own, taking care of our own planet, right? It's like, who cares? The planet's just the backdrop for all our cultural exploits, right? Because we don't know the things that we share it with. And we certainly don't think in terms of like non-human persons. So to me, maple trees aren't a resource that I exploit. Maple trees are another non-human person, another species, an entity that's got a way longer natural history than people. I mean, maple trees been around a lot longer than Homo sapiens or anything resembling a Homo sapien. They have just as much right to call Earth home as I do. I live by and through the relationship with them, but I don't like to think of them as just a thing I use. That's to me, that would be really gross with another person. I don't want those kind of interpersonal relationships. I just use them. It's like, I want real friendships and connection. Well, I want that with the things I make my body out of, right? So what happens is for a hunter-gatherer people, they know hundreds of species. Think about how different your world, your view of earth would be if you knew hundreds of species intimately. It's very easy to... I'm, I know it's gross and, and intense language to use, but it's really easy to rape the earth when you don't really know what's there. You know, a David Attenborough documentary is not enough to bring you up to speed. Maybe for an hour you feel like, oh, compassion for dolphins or something. But at the end of that, it doesn't change our actions every day. My opinion is that no amount of carbon offset credits no amount of guilt and shame, no amount of climate crisis. That's, that stuff's not enough to change people's actions. What changes people's actions is getting to know who you share the planet with. And I don't know a lot of ways to do that outside of actually starting to interact with species. And, and the respect for those species comes out of how you interact. So if I just think of maple trees as something that I want my cabinets to be made out of, well, that's maybe not enough, right? But if I think about like, I go out each day and I visit each of my trees and I take the collection bucket off and its blood is in that bucket, it's sap, and I bring that home and I cook it. And then when I share it with people, it brings joy to everybody around as they eat that in the morning on their, in their smoothie or on their pancakes or whatever. That creates this deep reverent love for the species and that's what's lacking. People talk about oak and they, they think of furniture, I think a flower, you know what I mean? So that kind of stuff I think is really important to how we, we you know, we're talk, we talk a lot about the climate crisis. I don't really buy that 
fully because I think that's a, become a catch-all for habitat loss and species diversity loss. And I don't see how we ever fix any of that stuff until people start to have meaningful, really meaningful relationships. Again, it's the same as um, we know it's really hard for human beings who aren't psychopaths to kill one another, but it gets easier the more removed they are. So it's a lot easier for a drone pilot to kill somebody than it is for a soldier face-to-face -to, -face to kill somebody. I mean, this has all been researched, right? It's easier for somebody in a jet to shoot somebody in another jet down because they can't see each other's faces. So it's kind of similar. It's really easy to exploit the planet when you have no relationship, meaningful relationship to any other species. Yeah, you, you may, you, earlier you said uh, we're made of food. And the interesting thing about that is we eat less and, and less of it. Uh, I, I got in trouble recently. I got a text from a neighbor, my children were at their house and uh, they, they texted me. They said they brought out a snack and my, one of my girls repeated something I say to them all the time. They said, that's not food. That's chemicals and calories. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we just, we just don't eat that much mm -hmm. real food. Uh, like yeah. you described, we need to, to eat more of that. You also talked about, so speaking of, of the, the killing and um, uh, being disconnected, I think a lot of people, as they hear you talk, they may be, um, there's a, they, they hear kind of a contradiction and they're trying to figure out how to square hunting um, with your love for nature and connection. And so mm -hmm. I got to ask, like at one point when you were a vegan, was that from an ethical standpoint or was it just health? And how do you think about hunting now based on your, your love of the planet and other species and connection? Yeah, I, it, it's funny because the only way for that, they call that the hunter's paradox, by the way. So this is something that, you know, has been looked at philosophically. Um, and, and to me, it becomes amusing over time because you realize that there is no contradiction. The, the lion doesn't hate the gazelle. That's not why the lion eats the gazelle. The gazelle is benefited from the predation by the lion. The lion really can be looked at this as the steward of the gazelle because through the predation, the gazelle gets better and its genes are honed for the future. It's improved every year. It's better at evading. It's, it's leaner, it's tighter, it's faster. It's, it's health has to be better because who gets picked off? The weak, the sick, the, the deteriorating, right? The synesing, the, the young, the children. So it, it causes you to become better, right? Uh, I don't think the bacteria and yeast that are all over my body right now that are just waiting for me to <laughs> flatline, right? They are, let's be real. Yeah. Yeah. They're waiting for me to flatline because they want to start the process of eating me. They try every day, but my immune system fights them back. Mm -hmm. They don't hate me. They just need to live and their job is to recycle dead things. And they're like, is this guy dead yet? Is this guy dead yet? Is this guy dead yet? Right? Um, my, I would argue that the species that I kill, you know, I'll, I'll just say this because it's so challenging. Like I kill black, those are all black bear skulls behind me. Mm -hmm. um, I eat black bears. That, to some people that is like, that's the worst, right? You know, it doesn't get much worse unless you start talking elephants and whales and stuff, right? So it's like, how could you do that? It's like, well, I love bears probably more than anybody listening. I would challenge anybody here. I mean, maybe there's a one-off like bear biologist listening who's like, you don't understand what I put in each year. And that might be true. But as far as um, most people never even have actually really been around a black bear unless they saw it crossing the road. Certainly don't know much about it. Certainly aren't in relationship with it. And certainly don't do the most intimate possible thing you can do on the planet, which is not make love. Make love is to make love is intimate. But to make love is two separate bodies that can walk away from each other after. To eat something is to make your body from the thing. The most intimate act. You are now part of me forever. There are parts of the black bears that I eat that what it'll take 10 years to cycle out of me. I, I am black bears. I love everything about their ecology, their natural history. I just want to know more and more about them. And one of the most interesting things, and I sometimes will call this the anti-hunters paradox, the way that you preserve a species in an era where human beings don't know the landscape anymore and they're just putting Walmarts everywhere and tearing down the last of everything that's left, the way you preserve something is you put a hunting season on it. And it's so counterintuitive at first, but people don't realize like, 
when you look at Africa and you go like, what's keeping elephants on the landscape? It's hunting. Because the average person who says they love elephants, how much are they willing to pay each year to protect elephants? Probably nothing. You might get billionaire philanthropists willing to throw a little money at that. But what really is paying for it is when there's a problem elephant tearing up a village, killing kids, and they bring in a hunter from the U.S. who's willing to pay thirty, forty thousand dollars for that elephant, and he gets a chance to hunt one, and then that thirty or forty thousand dollars goes into elephant conservation and to fight poaching and to keep wild lands available for all the kin of that elephant, if that makes sense. So, what's keeping black bears on the landscape? is that there are people like me obsessed with them who'll go to bat for them and will fight for them because I am made of black bears. I care about them. So you look at the things that people make their bodies out of, like look at corn. It's such an interesting example. It's like people have been willing to take some of the most valuable real estate on this continent and dedicate it exclusively to corn. Why? Because they make themselves out of it. So um, I'll also want to point this out too, that Every single person listening comes from a lineage of hunters. In other words, killers, right? And this is a big part of who we are. And when you remove that from your life completely, the neuroses that it creates about death is so extreme that as a hunter, you walk around, it's hard for people who are not like part of this to understand, but you walk around, you just see it on everyone's face, the fear of death. And you see that anything that reminds them of death, this is why people hate guts and blood and gristle. And this is why they want all of their meat to have names that hide what it is. So they don't want to hear pig, they want pork. They don't want to hear chicken, they want to hear poultry. They don't want to hear cow, they want to hear beef, right? They have all these, it's seafood, all these ways of of hiding that there's a species there. They want it delivered in a certain, there's this interesting thing when you butcher an animal because you go from something that looks very much to you like an animal to something that looks very much like it could have come from the supermarket. And there's this ease in the room when it goes to that supermarket looking phase, the skin's off, you've removed like any feet or beaks or, you know, teeth, anything like that. And then people are like, ah, now I can relax. Why? Because seeing it like that, it's so obvious. You're like, oh, without my skin, I look just like that. I'm meat I'm, and I'm going to die. There's no, you know, hunters, non-hunters don't often, it's like they don't realize. I know intellectually they might, but when the way they argue it, it's like they don't realize. Animals that don't get shot by a hunter don't live forever. They die and they die usually relatively soon. And usually how they die is either disease, injury, or being eaten alive by something that catches them, right? Like when a pack of wolves catches, you know, an elk, they start eating the elk while the elk's alive, you know, it's pretty gruesome. That's reality, right? People want like to create this like false utopian. By the way, the more utopian we try to make the world, the more oppressive it gets and the less freedom we have. I mean, I think people can kind of see that today. It's like really in our faces. Um, the more safe and padded you try to protect, you, you know, you make everything like death free. It just actually becomes like not worth living anymore. You know, you take a, a wild animal and you put it in the zoo and uh, guess what? It'll live longer than it would in the wild, but it sure won't be happy. Yeah. It's a pale, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a pale existence compared to the reality of what it could have lived in the wild, even if that meant it might die. So uh, for me, when I kill something, I am uh, actually so humbled because it's like, man, how much time do I have left? And how do I want to live it? And how do I want to utilize that time? Um, so I think constant reminders of death always were present for us. And now they're almost never present because we've artfully concealed them. It's like the story of uh, the Buddha who had all suffering and death hidden from him. Um, and it creates neuroses. And then people start acting very weird because they, they start thinking they're apes, uh, they're angels, not apes. And I think that's a real dangerous place to get to. Yeah, and that that uh, disconnection from death and where our food comes from, to me, is it's been a problem I've, I've felt personally for a while. And so I want to ask you kind of a, uh, I want to ask you a selfish question now, Please. because 
I had a dream um, a few years ago. And what I told myself is I said, when I turn 40, I'm going to spend a year only eating food that I've grown or I've harvested. And so I planted like a hundred fruit and nut trees. Of course, the deer ate all of them. Um, I tried to learn some skills. I tried to tap my maple trees to make maple syrup like you're talking about. I failed completely. Oh, and, no way. <laughs> now, now I've been, I've been 40 for three days and I've already completely oh, failed. Congratulations. Life on, on my begins. Mission. So, I, so I, I'm a failure. I'm an abject failure, but um, I want to get a little better. So like if someone did have that dream of, okay, I'm not going to eat I'm, everything that I eat. Isn't going to be what I have foraged or right. grown or hard to do, but I want to get better and just go towards that. How could someone start? Like what could they yeah. do to start living that way? Well, I started in my mid thirties. So, um, that's kind of, you know, I, I can relate. And uh, one of my, my bear hunting mentor, he's uh, in his seven, he's about 70. And he always says to me, Dan, your life don't start till you're 40. <laughs> um, I kind of have started to, to agree. Uh, so welcome to 40, man. It's a pretty awesome decade. Uh, it really is because you find you still have like so much physical vigor, but now you like understand the world a little more, you know, yeah. it's an exciting time. But um, the, the place for me that I think I always tell everybody where to start is you find a hunter safety course because you have to do that to hunt in the United States or Canada. So uh, more and more, those are just online now, but you need that basic course. And that's not because I'm saying to you like, Hey, you have you don't know what you're doing with safety. You, it's just that that's just what you have to jump through that hoop. And for a lot of people, there's stuff there that would be helpful for them to know. Uh, this is not a hunter's education. It's just a requirement for you then to be able to buy a hunting license. I'll tell people, if you have even the slightest interest in this stuff, get that hunting get that um, hunter safety course now. I got mine about five years before I started hunting. I just knew it was coming in my life and I wasn't sure when, but when that opportunity comes, like you, like, like you and I are hanging out and I go, Hey, you want to hunt turkeys next week? And you're like, well, I'd have to find a hunter safety course. It's like, you can't go. Yeah. Right. So yeah. just do it now, figure that out. And that way, when the opportunity arises, you can just go. Um, now with regard to hunting, what I'm also always telling people is, is find mentors. But I think with a lot of the people who listen to your show, um, people who have good incomes, people who have the means to do it is you, you hire guides and you go and you, and you don't, what I find kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to judge too much, but it's like, I'm way more interested in learning from a guide than I am in having my hand held and a plush chair and they feed me and massage my shoulders. And then, all I have to do is press a trigger because they, they do everything for me. That's not how I like to do that, right? So if I'm going to go out with a guide, I'm asking questions. I'm learning. I want to understand it. Even if I'll never be in that place again, I want to know how they're seeing the landscape, how they're seeing that animal. But man, you can have some incredible experiences uh, working with guides. Um, and if you do it locally, you can learn how to do the stuff in your own environment. Um, but if you are looking for something exotic, you want to travel, guides are the way to do it. When it comes to plants, it's a little different. Um, we have this joke where I'll say like, um, there's no poisonous lookalike deer. So when you're learning to hunt, it's not the same concerns. Like, oh man, I might mess this up and eat the wrong thing and die. Not going to happen with animals really. But with plants, you you know, the idea that there are plants that you'd accidentally eat and die, that's pretty far-fetched. Almost anything that has the ability to poison you like that has a flavor so bad that you would know you're eating the wrong thing. But um, certainly there are, it becomes more complex. So you want a mentor, you want to attend a foraging workshop, go on a plant walk, join a local botany group, any of those kind of things where you actually go out with somebody and they start to walk you through the landscape. And I always say to people, man, don't go into this like, oh my God, I got to learn 400 plants. I tell people like, if you can learn one plant a year, it's like, if you could make one good friend every year, you, this is something, you know, by 40, right? Cause if you're 40 years old and you could even count five people on your hand that you really trust in a pinch, that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, you start to realize after your teenage years, like people aren't necessarily, it takes a lot for two people to vibe enough that you really trust them. Mm -hmm. So if you could make a new friend who'll never desert you every single year, that's a non-human person, like a plant that I just wish you could like for one day be in my body and we drive down the road and you're looking out the window and you're not just seeing a wall of trees you're seeing individuals like you're seeing hey gold birch white birch gray birch 
white pine, red pine, Scots pine. Over there's a red maple. Over there's a you know white oak. Over there's a red oak. And you are seeing individuals. I always liken it to if you lived in a town you grew up in and you're driving down the road and everyone you see, you're waving to them because you know them all. You went to school with them or you know their parents or their cousins or you know all these people versus that new arrival in the city and you don't know anybody. And there's that sort of mm, kind of contracted, I'm all alone here feeling. That's how people feel in their own landscape. That's why when they get out in the woods and they don't know where they are, they panic because they don't know anyone around them, right? No non-human persons. So if you could learn one plant a year that you can actually work with and how to work with it and how to harvest it and what you you can do with it. Um, By the way, for people listening, let me add this caveat. Again, just based on who's listening, you all know what it's like to go to a fine dining restaurant and sit down and you, you open the menu and you see things like free range venison, foraged wild mushrooms, you know, wild foraged leeks. We're not talking about eating nuts and twigs and berries. We're talking about eating the food that the best chefs in the world are fighting to get their hands on and paying foragers top dollar to bring to them fresh. I'm working in my kitchen with the best ingredients you can imagine. So I'm not talking about like, oh, boring food. I'm talking about like the food of kings and queens. But if you can make one new plant relationship a year, awesome. The last piece, I mean, obviously there's things like algaes and things like that. We don't need to go down that road, but mushrooms are a big one. People love eating wild foraged mushrooms. This is where the most care is required. This is where you can actually actually kill yourself accidentally. So again, somebody who can take you out, going on mushroom walks, joining a local mushroom society. It's a great pastime. You meet some weirdos, but it's, it's fun. And, uh, eventually, you know, so I always tell people, Hey, one new thing a year, maybe one, maybe if you've got somebody, you're somebody who makes big goals. It's like, all right, I want to learn one new plant, one new mushroom. And I want to hunt one new animal this year. And at the end of the year, you're going to feel so much more connected to the planet than you feel today. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I, um, I, I had, uh, a dozen questions here and I've asked you two of them. And so what I would suggest to people, I'm long winded um, because, because we're, we're kind of out of time is if you, if you want to learn more, I'll do all the things that Daniel said, but also Daniel has a TV show, uh, watch the wild fed TV show, listen to his podcast. Um, and then, uh, if you want to come and hang out with us at the end of May, uh, you're talking about foraging wild plants. We're going to have Sam Thayer with us, who is kind of my mentor when it comes to that, just reading his books. Best um, in the country. Some, yeah. yeah, he's he's amazing. You'll be able to uh, not die, at least. We're definitely not going <laughs> to. You might even live a little. Plants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you want to come to the conference with Daniel and I, uh, May 28th, go to wildhealthsummit.com. And um, I'm looking at all these other questions I'm dying to ask you. We're just out of time. You want to so, rapid fire any of them? No, you know what? No, because they're too important. Like I just, yeah. when you come to Kentucky, I want to ask you awesome. all then. Maybe we'll awesome. record some then. And Great, release I love that. that. But, uh, but you've got, I don't know how many episodes. So you talked about kind of the uh, wells and elephant hunting and the controversy around that earlier. You have a podcast recently where you talked to somebody about that. So I really, yeah. if you're listening to this and you're interested at all, I'll definitely encourage you to listen to Daniel's podcast. Um, it's my favorite podcast out there. And thank you for that. I just, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And I can't wait to see you here in Kentucky in about a month or so. Oh, I can't wait, man. And it's an honor to get a chance to talk about these things. Thanks so much. And again, everybody listening, if you made it this far, thank you so much for uh, listening to my very long responses to these questions. I appreciate your time and your ear today. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.